All right, we'll try that again. That sounds better. Good morning. <laughs> Great to start the day out with a little technical difficulties, but welcome to New Era Reformed Church. It's a beautiful, sunny, sunny day. Glad to have you all here with us this morning. Um, the chance to just gather together after a week and to start another week. Uh, we will have fellowship time afterwards, so please, if you are visiting with us, uh, join us. Um, enjoy some cookies and some coffee and a chance for us to get to know you. So um, just a couple announcements before we get started. Um, it is um, Pastor Ben is starting a new series this morning of the book of Amos, which is one that you may have to look in the uh, table of contents to find one of the minor prophets in the Old Testament. So we will um, hear from him um, what God spoke through Amos to the people back then, um, but also to us today. So that starts today. Uh, we do also have a informational forum after the service today. Is that back in here in the fellowship hall? Um, just looking at some of the pros and cons of the different uh, denominations that we have been looking at, um, moving ahead to try to make a decision on where um, we will go. There will be a vote on that May 5, um, so keep that date in mind. And there is information um, in the fellowship hall about all the different ones that we've looked at. If you have questions, um, grab one of those, um, but stay in the fellowship hall afterwards. Um, grab a cookie and such too. Um, but just to hear that discussion and be involved in that, it's an important decision. So as we get ready then uh, to turn our hearts uh, to worship and get started today, I'm actually going to read a couple verses out of another minor prophet, um, Zephaniah, another one that's a little hard to find. Um, but hear these words from Zephaniah. Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout aloud, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. For the Lord will remove his hand of judgment and will disperse the armies of your enemy. And the Lord himself, the King of Israel, will live among you. At last, your troubles will be over and you will never again fear disaster. On that day, the announcement to Jerusalem will be, Cheer up, Zion, do not be afraid. For the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty Savior. He will take delight in you with gladness, and with his love he will calm all your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. And those words were given from God through Zephaniah to the people of Israel, looking ahead to a really hard time, captivity, 70 years. Um, but God was going to come and rescue them for that. It also is a reference to the Messiah coming and living amongst us and bringing salvation. And for us on this side of the cross, it is a reminder that God will come again um, and bring all end to fear and pain and all of that sin has brought to this world. And we have a mighty, mighty Savior. So the first song we're going to sing um, is mighty to save. And I just wanted to call out the words of the chorus of that song as we get started. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. He is the author of our salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. And we celebrate and we live in that truth today. So let's stand up, greet somebody around you, and we're going to get ready to worship. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here this morning. Um, let's lift up our voices as we worship the Lord through song this morning. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing, that mercy flow on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of
define me, all my fears and failures, fill my life again, I give my life to follow, everything I believe in, now I Zephaniah 3, verse 17. The Lord your God is with you. The mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me all my days. I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake Thank you. 
Father, we do sing about the goodness of you and your Son and Holy Spirit. May you touch our hearts today on this beautiful sunny day, and may the message that Pastor Ben gives us resonate with us as we live today, tomorrow, and this week and this month. Bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. Just a couple updates on prayer requests. Um, Aaron Stevens is doing really, really well, uh, even surprising the doctors. So we're going to keep praying for that. Um, if you could pray for discernment for my daughter, Adeline, she's got some big decisions in front of her. If she wants to tell you, I'll let her. Uh, but uh, Friday, we were given a real surprise. And since last June, we've been looking at colleges. So it seems like it's forever. Uh, but uh, something happened on Friday that was a real pleasant surprise, and now she's got big decisions in front of her, so um, we're going to pray for her discernment. And then um, uh, on Thursday evening, a good friend of ours, a family friend, um, their daughter committed suicide. She was 19 in Fremont, so we went uh, to, the, to the funeral on, on Thursday, and so we're going to pray for them. That's Don and Jeff Petri, um, P A. It sounds like Petri, but it's spelled. It's pronounced Petri, and we're going to pray for them this morning too. So pretty, pretty devastating. There's a whole history there, um, but they thought they had turned a corner, and then they went away for a week, and she stayed home, and she did it on them. Yeah, so the week before, so. So let us go to God in prayer, understanding that there's war and conflict, and then there's the peace of the Lord as well with us. So let's. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning from a variety of paths, doing a variety of different things, all gathered here for one purpose, to worship you, to glorify your name, to live a life that is worthy of the calling that we have in Christ, and to be filled with the Spirit. And this morning, Lord, may this happen for us. Lord, we're surrounded by war and rumors of war and all the struggles that are going on in the world, and it seems so overwhelming. If we spend too much time in the news, we can get depressed because there's so much bad stuff going on. But maybe that's how it's always been after the fall. Maybe it's always been a broken world full of sin and sinful people. And in all of that darkness, there is this light, Christ our Lord, who has come back to not only save sinners from their sins, but also to begin renewing creation. And so, Lord, as we live in these difficult times, dark times, whatever word we want to use, help us to focus on the message of the gospel, that there is good news, eternally good news, and remembering that this life on planet Earth is very temporary, 
before we know it, we're 30, before we know it, we're 60, before we know it, we're 80, and life goes by like a mist. And so, Lord, as we, as we try to live in these days, give us strength to be faithful. Father, I pray for a consistory as we get closer and closer to figuring out a final decision here. Give them wisdom and discernment and strength. For the congregation, the body here, also give them wisdom and strength. I pray that you would in, in strengthen them to follow your word and to stand by that and stand on it. And so, Lord, as we have a discussion today about that, I pray that people's minds and hearts would become clearer, that they would have discernment as we go forward. Lord, we also pray for those who are sick amongst us. We pray for Rhonda. I know that she had a couple of health issues. We ask, Lord, that you bring continued healing for her. We're so thankful for the progress that Aaron has had through all this chemo and that her body is holding up. And once again, Lord, we ask that you would keep her strong, keep her body strong, and pray, Lord, that the medicine is very effective. Give the wisdom from on high from those doctors who are helping her in this treatment and implementing it. And Lord, destroy those cancer cells. Get rid of them. May the medicine take full effect. Lord, I also pray for Adeline. I pray that you would give her wisdom and discernment in the next, next coming weeks here. Where do you want her, Lord? She's your daughter. I pray, Lord, that you would, you would uh, guide her and make it clear to her. And sadly, Lord, uh, this week we had to mourn with our good friends, Jeff and Don Petrie, as they said, said goodbye to their oldest daughter. Um, Lord, we ask that you would be with them. The, the grieving has just begun. The next years are going to be terrible for them. Every birthday, every Christmas, every Thanksgiving. Lord, I pray that you would give them peace. And whether they know it or not, Lord, I pray that you would be right there with them, lifting them up. Help the other siblings as well. Give them strength. Give them assurance of faith. And Lord, for anyone here who has thought about suicide, Lord, lift them up out of that muck and mire. Give them the hope and the light of Christ. Help them through whatever they're going through, that darkness. They feel like they have no other option, but there is Christ and he's there waiting for them. Lord, thank you for this time where we can be real with you. We can lay our burdens down and we can come to you before that cross and see in the darkness light. And where there is no hope, we have the hope of Christ, the assurance of faith. Impress this upon us. And as we go into a new book, Amos, Lord, speak to us. Help us understand the prophet today, who the prophet is, what his role was, and how that relates to us in the 21st century in America. Thank you for this time, for inclining your ear to us, for hearing our prayers. Lord, bless us, and we trust that you will answer them as you see fit. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, amen. amen. We have one offering this morning. It's for the general fund, so that handles all of our general operations for the church. Can I have deacons come forward, please? So we're going to sing ancient words. We would love it if you stand, if able, and join us as we um, prepare our hearts for the message from Pastor Ben.
As we open your word and as we hear from Pastor Ben, it is our prayer that you, you open our hearts to what you want us to learn today. Your scripture is full of everything that we need for comfort, for peace, for encouragement, for discipline. It, Lord, it's there for everything. Help our hearts to be opened that we can learn from you today. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. So before we go into God's word for you astute bulletin observers, uh, the passage for next week is the same that you did for this week. That was my fault. Uh, as I dug into the sermon series more, I thought it'd be best if we did a little of chapter 7, well, we did chapter 7 today instead of chapter 1. That way we can learn a little bit about who Amos is. So next week, if, as you're preparing, it's chapter 1 through chapter six, chapter 2, verse 16. So the bulletin has that as you prepare for this. We're going to read just the beginning of Amos chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, and then we're jumping over to chapter 7, because today the whole point of this is to be introduced to who Amos is, to think about his role as you read this book and go through it. And I like what Betsy said, these, these books, the minor prophets, are often overlooked, right? We can't even pronounce their names, right? Habakkuk, and is it Haggai or is it Haggai, which is what the Hebrew says, right? So these they're different, and uh, they play a role, though, and they're just as important as other parts of God's Word. So 
That's what we're going to tackle today. So Amos chapter 1, verses 1 to 2, because this sets the tone, and we'll come back to this again. I want you to notice what the Lord is doing in this book, okay? So let us begin. The word of Amos, one of the shepherds of Tekoa, the vision he saw concerning Israel two years before the earthquake when Uzziah was king of Judah and Jeroboam son of Jehoash was king of Israel. He said, now what's the Lord doing in this book? The Lord roars from Zion and thunders from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherd dry up and the top of Carmel withers. So what should we expect in this as God brings His word to His people? He's going to roar, so it's going to be uncomfortable, and He has a lot to say to us, okay? Over to chapter 7 now. We're going to read the whole thing. This has a little bit of biographical information in the situation of ministry, so beginning in verse 1. This is what the sovereign Lord showed me. He was preparing swarms of locusts after the king's share had been harvested and just as the late crops were coming up. When they had stripped the land clean, I cried out, Sovereign Lord, forgive! How can Jacob survive? He is so small. So the Lord relented. This will not happen, the Lord said. This is what the Sovereign Lord then showed me. The Sovereign Lord was calling for judgment by fire. It dried up the great deep and devoured the land. And then I cried out, Sovereign Lord, I beg you, stop. How can Jacob survive? He is so small. So the Lord relented. This will not happen either, the Sovereign Lord said. This is what He showed me. The Lord was standing by a wall that had been built true to plumb, with a plumb line in His hand. And the Lord asked me, What do you see, Amos? A plumb line, I replied. Then the Lord said, look, I am setting a plumb line among my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. The high places of Isaac will be destroyed and the sanctuaries of Israel will be ruined. With my sword, I will rise up against the house of Jeroboam. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent a message to Jeroboam, king of Israel. Amos is raising a conspiracy against you in the very heart of Israel the land cannot bear all his words. For this is what Amos is saying. Jeroboam will die by the sword and Israel will surely go into exile away from their native land. Then Amaziah said to Amos, get out of here, you seer. That's a word for prophet. Get out of here, you seer. Go back to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there. Don't eat our bread. And do your prophesying there. Do not prophesy anymore at Bethel because this is the king's sanctuary and the temple of the kingdom. Notice there, whose kingdom is this supposed to be? Jeroboam thinks it's his, but who's it supposed to be? Right? Amos answered Amaziah in a rather precious way. I was neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but I was a shepherd, and I also took care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from tending the flock and said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. Now then, hear the word of the Lord, Amaziah. You say, do not prophesy against Israel and stop preaching against the descendants of Isaac. Therefore, this is what the Lord says, and this is your first taste of Amos. Your wife will become a prostitute in the city, and your sons and daughters will fall by the sword. Your land will be measured and divided up, and you yourself will die in a pagan country or unclean country, and Israel will surely go into exile away from their native land. The Lord has roared. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> the Garricky family immigrated to the U.S. in the late 1800s from Germany. They chose Gordonville, Missouri. I looked that up this week. Gordonville, Missouri, as the 2020 census shows, had 625 citizens in it. So imagine what it was like in the late 1800s. Bilingual in German and English, the Garricks taught their children the high piety of the Reformed Protestantism that they were taught. Being German, they were naturally Lutheran and specifically Missouri Synod. They taught their children how to pray and how to read Scripture, and it was a natural course for one of their sons, Henry, to pursue ministry. Henry was ordained to the Missouri Synod in 1926, and he had almost 20 years of pastoral work, including prison ministry experience when the U.S. declared war on Germany. 
in 1943, Garricky and 253 other Missouri Synod Lutheran pastors went to chaplaincy school at Harvard University in preparation to serve in the war effort. By March 1944, Garricky was assigned to the U.S. Army's 98th Hospital in England. So if you know your dates about World War II, this is pre the D-Day invasion. He said it was pretty barren in the hospital at that point, maybe some appendix or tonsils or whatever. But Garricky recounts that after D-Day 6, the casualties began flooding in. A month later, he was in a hospital in Munich, Germany, and while he was there, Garricky decided to go to the, the Dachau concentration camp, and Henry recounts in his letters back to his wife, my hand was touching the wall, and it was smeared with human blood, and the wall was bleeding blood through it. By 1945, Garricky had had enough of war. Two of his sons were seriously wounded in the Battle of the Bulge, and he had just learned that his youngest son had enlisted and was coming over to the war front. But God's going to call Garricky to do something even more difficult than he already had done. In 1945, November, Garricky was called into the meeting with Colonel James Sullivan. The 52-year-old Garricky was being assigned to the 6850th Internal Security Detachment at Nuremberg. Nuremberg is where the trial of the century took place. If you know your history, I hope you do. The Nuremberg trials is where the surviving Nazi leaders were put on trial before the whole world for crimes against humanity. Names like Rudolf Hess, and Hermann Goering were at the top of his list. And this is what Garricky's job was if he was to take it. He was to be the spiritual advisor and chaplain to the top Nazi war criminals while they were going through trial. Now, Colonel Sullivan offered his opinion to Garricky. This is the most unpopular assignment around. And I suggest you use your age and go back to inactive duty and head back to the States. But Garricky, being a man of faith, says, well, let me pray about that first. He prayed for God's guidance in this, and Garricky recounts, slowly the men at Nuremberg became to me just lost souls who I was being asked to help. Sometimes God asks us to do difficult things. You're going to see this in this book, Amos, but you're also going to see this in Garricky's story. This heavy call of Garricky to actually minister to these Nazi criminals is scriptural if we think about it. Paul was to go before Caesar. Peter and John witnessed before the Sanhedrin and were flogged for it. Daniel had to serve in Nebuchadnezzar's court and then Cyrus's court after Nebuchadnezzar was toppled. God has sent his faithful servants to dreadful places to be a light. This is the same for the prophet Amos. Amos was no prophet. That's what makes him interesting. He was a herdsman, and the word is different than just a shepherd of sheep. He probably tended cattle, sheep, and goats, and he was quite good at it. He was also a sycamore tree grower. So on a word for all of you, he was a farmer. He was a farmer, and he was called to be a prophet to the northern kingdom to call them out for their sins. Does that sound like fun? Sometimes God calls us to do difficult things, and Amos' life story is part of that. So before we go any further into that, though, we need to spend a few moments thinking about what the, the office of the prophet is in the Old Testament. In evangelical circles, pro prophecy is wildly misunderstood Pastors will proclaim themselves as prophets. My gifts are in prophecy, not in administration. Well, pastor, you still have to put your reports in, okay? And then congregants will say something to the effect of, I have a prophetic gift, which often means God's telling me things he's not telling you. And if you want to know, I'll be happy to share. Be wary about this because the prophet is not an easy call. It requires sacrifice, giving up the work you love to go do hard things for God. So let's take a look at when this office was officially established. Deuteronomy 18 is where we would go. And if you want to read the whole thing, it's 14 to 22, but we do have it up here. As we just, and I'm going to just focus on a few verses. Deuteronomy 18, 15 to 16. 
The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, like me is uh, me is Moses, okay, from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him, for this is what you asked of the Lord your God at Horeb on that day of the assembly when you said, let us not hear the Lord, the voice of the Lord our God, nor see this great fire anymore, or we will die. So one of the interesting things that comes out of that is when God's presence was at the mountain and the mountain was smoking, right? Remember that? When they were first gathered as God's people, his presence was too overwhelming for them. So when anybody says to me, well, pastor, I'm not going to listen to you, but I'll listen to God. You don't want God showing up at your front door because every human who does that in scripture falls to their knees. They can't see. He sends people because it's easier for us to handle it. And in this case, this is the prophet. 18 to 22 goes into a little bit deeper what the purpose of this is. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites. I will put my words in his mouth. That's key. He will tell them everything I command him. I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name, anything I have not commanded, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods is to be put to death. So how many of you want to be a prophet now? Being prophetic still is true in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, but it comes at a cost. If you're bringing God's word to people who don't want to hear it, how do you think your relationships are going to be? Right? So this is the role that Amos is is being called to now god has sent many prophets to the old covenant old testament covenant people let me ask you did they listen did they listen to jeremiah ezekiel did they listen to zephaniah zachariah you name them habakkuk jonah's a little bit different jonah's emblematic of all of israel he is israel that's a little bit different take on it but when you think about generally prophets bringing the word of god to his people did they listen well, what does Jesus say about this? Let's go back to Luke for a minute. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. This is well before he got to Jerusalem. You who kill the prophets in stone those sent to you. How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. So what kind of definition should we think about when we're thinking about the prophet? I have one from my beloved professor, Carl Bosma. It's always stuck with me once he said it in class. The prophet is the last line of defense before God brings judgment. So you can either listen to the word and you can repent or I'm going to discipline you. And God's discipline is effective and true. So think about what God is asking Amos. Leave your family and the work that you love and go up to your wayward brothers and sisters in the northern kingdom to save them. And by the way, Amos, they're not going to listen to you. This is the work of the prophet, and sometimes God calls us to do difficult things. So now let's turn to chapter 7 and look at some of these visions. This is good practice to think about how we interpret visions. The first vision is this. The Lord God showed me he was forming a swarm of locusts. So this is a swarm of locusts I found online in Africa. And that's one on someone's skin. It's basically a type of grasshopper. So he sees God forming this swarm of locusts. So what do you think the farmer is going to say? Oh boy, protect the crops, right? There was no Roundup Ready Alfalfa, right? Protect the crops. God is going to send this locust to the late spring harvest. I don't know if you caught it in the NIV, but it's, the, it's after the king gets his share, right? The king's share had been harvested, and just as the late crops were coming up, the people got the second harvest, and God is going to send the locust on the second harvest. Amos intervenes like a good shepherd. Lord, forgive. Jacob is too small for this. And so the Lord relented. Then there's a second vision. God is calling up a judgment with fire. The fire is going to lap up the deep and devour the land. And the deep is water. Usually it's the ocean, the deeps of the water. One commentator believes that this is a famine that's going to be stricken on the land. It could be. It's not out of the realm of possibility, but I think we can take this at face value. It's a, 
it's a fire that's going to be purifying and devastating and will ruin everything. Once again, the shepherd intervenes, Lord God, please stop, and God relented. Now, God is just in bringing these locusts and bringing this fire, but His mercy prevails. And we have these We have these passages where we see this with God, where he's going to do something and then he relents because his grace and his mercy prevail. God is willing to forgive, but if his people continually go against his holy name, he will judge. And then there's this third vision, which is where the judgment comes in. Then the Lord God showed me a wall perfectly straight and plumb. So those of you who are builders, God will call to account his people because... They are crooked or bent in their sins. God will call His people to account because they are out of balance and He will no longer pass over their sins. It's the same verb that we see in the Passover way back in Exodus. I'm no longer going to pass over them. Those high places which are mentioned here, those are pagan temples. And they're among God's people and they will be destroyed in their self-made sanctuaries. There's supposed to be one place to go to the sanctuary that was in Jerusalem, right? But what happens? Jeroboam started one in his, his northern kingdom. Then there's one down in the south. They, they started making their own things and doing their own thing. He's also going to call Jeroboam to account and cut down his household. Now, Amos, go tell this to your brothers and sisters. This is what it means to be prophetic. That's the first part. Second part. It's hard enough to see the visions and bring that word, but it's much harder to deliver to a people who will not listen to the prophetic word. So Amaziah, we meet the priest. He tells King Jeroboam that Amos is trying to stir up some sedition here, stirring up a controversy or conspiracy against you. He's saying you will die by the sword in Israel, go into exile. Now here's the conundrum when you're, a pro- when you're prophetic. If you're trying to tell somebody the truth about their sins, It's true that that's what's going to happen, but they don't want to hear it. So what do you do with that? God had said, if you will not follow my ways, you're going to lose the promised land. You're going to go into exile. Everything that happened, God was true to his word. It wasn't like a surprise. He said this, if you do this, then you will stay in the land. If you don't do this, then I'm going to discipline you and I'm going to exile you. So there was the Babylonians, then the Assyrians. There's a whole group of them. Eventually the Greeks and eventually the Romans. So Amaziah confronts Amos. Get out of here, you, you seer. Go back to Judah and prophesy there. Don't eat our food. Go home. And Amos' response is rather precious. Look, buddy, I don't even want to be here. I'm a herdsman, and I really miss my trees and my flocks. I'd rather be pruning sycamore fig trees than come here and put up with your garbage. But this is what God has called me to do. How many times have you found yourself like in that situation where you've got to do things that you know God's calling you to do, but you don't want to do it? And how sad is this situation that a priest of the Lord does not want to allow the prophet of the Lord to do his work? If the priest was a true priest, he, would, he could test Amos' word with Scripture. But Amaziah doesn't care about that. So Amaziah tries to stop Amos. And then Amos, who is not going to be politically correct for us, he's not going to be nice, he's not going to be comforting as we go through this, he's going to basically say, seek God and live. That's what he's going to say through this whole thing. And if that's a theme sentence for us as we go through this book, it's that. Seek God and live. Once Amos says, hey, I don't even want to be here, then he says, okay, Amaziah, this is what God says to you. Your wife will become a prostitute in the city. Your children will die by the sword, and you will die in a Gentile, pagan, unclean land, the worst thing for a priest. Israel will surely go into exile. This is the word of the Lord. What we will see in Amos and and all the prophets is the hard-heartedness of God's people. And I, I would say it's the most difficult thing in the whole wide world to deal with. And the church is full of it. Many self proclaimed Christians live however they want to live. I'm going to move in with my girlfriend. I'm going to move in with my boyfriend. I'm going to gossip behind the church's back or behind that person's back. 
I'm going to do what makes me feel happy. And I like asking people when they're sinning, say, well, what do you think God's word says about that? And they, they just kind of do this little squirmy little dance about, well, I'm, you know, and I'm, uh, um, and I never really get a full sentence out. When we live like we want to live and make ourselves happy, we only reap these locusts and fire and this plumb line. And the way of living that we think is best never fully satisfies. God's way is always best. And as your chief under-shepherd here, I can only tell you to follow God's word. That's where a true life is, right? I can't tell you, I can't make you feel differently about things. All I can do is point you to God's word. Yes, there's discipline and all that stuff, but behind elders and pastors is the great shepherd and the great king. And he can discipline ways that we could never think of as effective. He knows you. He's willing to pick you up out of the muck and mire, but he's not willing to let you trample on his name forever and ever. Godly sorrow is what he's calling us to. Godly sorrow that leads to repentance. So as we go through this book, Amos will confront us with all kinds of dangers, the dangers of affluence, the dangers of pursuing worldly pleasures. He talks literally about stone mansions here. Israel is doing quite well at this time. Don't pursue those things. Seek God and live. The other part of this is it doesn't really matter what the world thinks of you. Well, everybody else has got a second house on the lake. Why can't we, right? Someone has a second house on the lake? Hallelujah. The world is ignorant of the way of righteousness. It's different. He's calling us to seek him. So whatever is in our way with God as we go through Amos, let us repent of that, whatever we need to get rid of, whatever hinders our relationship. Let us take the medicine that God is offering. Back to Henry Garricky. Garricky heeded God's calling and ministered to these high Nazi officials. He began to speak to them in German because that was what they were most comfortable with, but eventually they went back and forth with English and German. Many of them were fluent in both. He held weekly worship services where he preached from Scripture, they sang hymns, and they also offered the Lord's Supper to those who repented. Garricky even met the families of these high Nazi officials. So in the spring of 1946, a rumor went around that Garricky was going to retire and leave the United States Army. It was not started by Garricky. 21 of the men at the Nuremberg trial penned a letter to Mrs. Garricky back in Missouri. That's, it's a great letter, but I only want to focus on one part of it. They wrote to Mrs. Garricky, Our dear Chaplain Garricky is nece necessary for us, not only as a pastor, but also as the thoroughly good man that he is. So now these German Nazis are calling him pastor. Mrs. Garricky replied to her husband, They need you, quote unquote. Garricky will follow these men all the way to the gallows. Some of them repented of their sins and became believers in Christ. Some were defiant until the end. Some were given prison sentences, and a few were found not guilty. Hermann Goering's wife, and he was one of the hardest, urged their young daughter, Edda or Ida, I'm not sure how to say that, Edda, I think, to speak with Henry Garricky. Surprised that this young girl wanted to speak to him, he asked her, have you said your prayers today? Edda responded, I pray every night. And how do you pray, Garricky asked. A little Edda answered, I nail by my bed and ask God to open my daddy's heart and let Jesus in. So do you see light even in such evil darkness that the daughter of Hermann Goering was a believer in praying for him? Garricky will say about these men, here died 11 men of intelligence who differently influenced could have been, I am convinced, a blessing to the world instead of a curse. Now, after Garricky's death, Garricky's son found that he had a secret compartment in his desk, and in it was this big, huge packet full of hate mail towards Garricky. Many, of, uh, many accused Garricky of being a Nazi lover or a Jew hater, and some even said that he should have been hung with the rest of them. The gospel ministry does not make sense to the world. And when God calls you to do difficult things, you have to do it out of faith, trusting that he will get you through. 
No way did Garricky think that we would be talking about him years later. He just prayed and God sent and he did what God asked him to do. And he cared for these men and loved on them. But he also wasn't a pushover either. There's more to the story. There's two books that you could look at, The Mission at Nuremberg by Townsend or a book called War and Grace by Stevens that chronicles Garricky's work. Sometimes God calls us to do difficult things in the faith. Oftentimes, people do not understand even fellow believers. Sometimes the person who is sent doesn't even understand. You will feel under-equipped, but what's amazing about Garricky is what? He was equipped from the day he was born all the way to that point to do that job. And so aren't you. God has used you, your mom reading stories when you're a little girl or a little boy. You don't know how that all plays into God's divine plan. He will send you, he will equip you, and he will get you through whatever he calls you to do. And as we dive into Amos, the call is going to be the same. Seek God and you will live. Let us pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for our brother, Henry Garricky, who was such a faithful witness in such trying times. Lord, use us that same way. There are things that we don't want to do that you have called us to do. Give us strength to seek you and to live. Lord, strengthen us as your congregation here at New Era. Bless us with the peace of Christ and the understanding of your word. And most of all, give us the spirit to live it out so we can be a light shining in a dark place. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us respond in song. Please stand. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well. Sinners, come find me.
Receive a blessing from the Lord from Romans in 15, chapter 15. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you.